Well, ladies and gentlemen, hello again. Welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name is Graham. This is X-Plane 11 and the Hot Start TBM 900. This is part two of the video series. In part one, we looked at uh, standard setup, taxi out, take off and climb from Glasgow. And in part two, we're going to have a look at the ILS approach into Aberdeen. We're just a few minutes from top of descent and we need to set the aircraft up for the arrival. So let's have a look inside. So in the cruise, we've got the approach chart for Aberdeen displaying now. We're going to fly the arrival from the waypoint Glesk, uh, as we saw on part one. The waypoint is around, around about here. Towards the 25 mile point from Aberdeen, turning across following a DME arc with some step-down arches of 4,000, 3,200 and 2,500 in towards the Alpha Tango Foxtrot, 2,500 feet and down a 3-degree three three glide path on a course of 340 degrees. The minimum we're going to use is uh, 420 and we've got that already set on the aircraft. So let's have a look and see how that's going to work. So first things first, we need to get the aircraft set up for the descent. Glesk flight level 90, we already have uh, on the VNAV system. I'm going to allow the aircraft to do that should we get to the descent point. So I'm going to set flight level 90 in blue here. And I'm going to arm VNAV. So we've got VPATH and it should go down to flight level 90. Now, before we go too much further, the way the G1000 is implemented in X-Plane is a little bit different from the real thing. If I change the view to show cumulative distance, from here to Glesk is only 40 miles. But the system is planning going from Glesk to the airfield and then back out to Glesk again. There's no way it's 92 miles to Glesk, it's only the 39 miles it shows on here. So what I need to do is activate the approach phase now, I can only do that when Glesk is the two-way point. Whenever I activate Approach, it's going to forget what it's doing here and go straight into Direct to Glesk. So what I need to do is to make sure that the 9,000 feet that's reflected here, or flight level 90, is also on this side. Because otherwise, when I activate the Approach, I'll lose track of that 9,000. Now, as I said, there's two ways we can do the approach. Let me bring it up here so you can see it. I've got Activate Approach or Activate Vectors to Final. Activate Approach will take me direct to the first point, Glesk in this case, whereas if I do Activate Vectors to Final, it will take me to the final approach fix, the FI-34 in this case. So it's Activate Approach I'm interested in. I'll not do that just now, but just to be aware of that. Now, I need to look at the vertical profile as well. And this is one part where the Laminar G1000 flight plan is not correct. So, we had 4,000, 3,200 and 2,500, but those were at or above altitudes, and it's actually coded on here as being at those altitudes. So that would not allow me to fly a continuous descent approach. It would simply drive straight down to 4,000 feet and fly level. So what I'm going to do is remove that. I'll push clear on the 4000 and it goes white, which means it's not actually in the system, but it's indicating above 4000. I'll do the same with the next waypoint by clearing. And again, the next waypoint uh, all the way down. So the only one I'll leave in is the ATF. That means once I get to Glesk, the VNAV profile should then move on to doing 2,500 feet at Glesk. So that kind of makes sense, and we'll talk about that, managing that descent as we do it. The last thing I've got to do is we've got the uh, radio aids tuned here, IABD for the ILS and Aberdeen uh, VOR on the number two instrument. I need to make sure that my uh, DME indicator here is looking at NAV2 for the Aberdeen VOR rather than NAV1. 
And most importantly, I've also got to make sure I've got the inbound core set for the uh, ILS localizer. Now, I can't see that at the moment. I need to change the CDI presentation. So I'm going to synchronize the heading, go into heading mode. I'm going to change through the CDI to localizer one. And I'm going to set the course to 340 degrees, which is the inbound for Aberdeen. So there's 340. Recycle the CDI back to GPS, put it back into NAV, check my FMAs, and I'll note that VNAV uh, has dropped off there. So I'll put VNAV back on. We've got VPath flight level 90. So that's us more or less set up for the uh, initial part of the approach. In a few seconds, the aircraft's going to warn me about vertical path. And we need to remember that it's a manual power aircraft. There's no auto thrust on this aircraft. Vertical track. So there we go. Top of descent is within one minute. I'm going to use that as a cue to check that I'm allowing the aircraft to go into uh, flight level 90. And we've got V-Path armed. Now that we've got 82% torque at the moment. When we start downhill, I'm going to ease that back. I'm going to take about 40% off, so target about 40-42% to 42 torque. I don't need to do that. I can leave the power setting where it is, and the aircraft will accelerate downhill. But my objective on this approach is to try and maintain around about 200 knots, just so that I get into the habit of flying manual thrust, manual power, with the aircraft. So descending in about 15 seconds, we can see the vertical profile coming down. I'm going to start easing the power off. My objective is to stay between about 195 and 205 knots, just to manage the descent correctly. So they've got V-Path, it's going down to flight level 90. And I'm bringing the power back a little bit more rapidly now, back to around about... We said 40% initially, let's see what happens and it's going to hold around about that airspeed. So that's the initial part of the descent. Now, what's interesting is that 9,000 feet is showing in magenta and in blue. Blue selected and magenta for the VNAV path. It's saying ALS for selected. If I change the selected altitude to below 9,000, it's gone into ALT-V, which tells me it's going to stop at the VNAV profile not the selected profile. If I wind it up above, it goes back to Alt-S, saying it's going to stop at the selected profile, the selected altitude. What's important is if I'm using vertical speed mode for the descent, it will only ever use the blue figure here. And that's important because you could leave this programmed, leave all these constraints in, put 2,500 feet in the altitude window, push VNAV and have it follow the descent. And if during that initial descent, so you've got, let's say, 2,500 in here and 4,000 in magenta, and you inadvertently go into VS mode, the end result is going to be an altitude bust. So we always want to be aware of what our selected altitude is and how that compares to the VNAV profile. But we're flying it basically on the blue altitude here. Now remember I said we had to consider activating the flight plan as well. Looking at the FMAs, at the moment we're navigating from ASNUD to Ganki. And I said if I was to activate the approach using the PROC button here, it would go straight to GLESC. So I can't do that at the moment because Ganki is the next waypoint. But once Ganki is sequenced, as it's about to do, once Ganki is sequenced, the aircraft is navigating from Ganki to Glesk. So I can go on here, activate approach, enter, now it goes direct to Glesk, and you can see the flight plan is in the approach segment. Just scroll that down so we can see all the relevant information there. So as we're descending, constant position of the power lever, but the torque is starting to increase as it goes into slightly denser air. I'll just start easing that back. In the descent, we've got Aberdeen for the landing field elevation selected. Pressurization is behaving correctly. We're just approaching flight level 100, so to keep things easy and to manage the workload, I'll put the landing light on and I'll put the inertial separator on, just so I don't forget later. So 
So we need to consider how we're going to do the final intercept on this approach. We looked at how the CDI is currently displaying the GPS information, and we know at some point it needs to transition over to displaying the ILS information. Now, the aircraft will do that by itself with a number of conditions being met. Most importantly for this approach, the final approach fix, there's the master caution for the separator, the final approach fix needs to be the two waypoint. So the aircraft needs to be navigating towards Fox India 34 before the aircraft will switch to ILS presentation. That is not satisfactory on this approach because I want to intercept at the ATF and not at the Fox India. I want to intercept here rather than here. So I'll need to do the transition from GPS to ILS presentation manually. So we'll keep an eye on that in the final stages. Less than a thousand feet to go till we level at 9,000. And I've got to remember that as I level, the power that I took out for the descent, I need to put that back in again. We're using about 44% thrust, 44% uh, torque, sorry. And as we level, I'll ease that forward to around about 80%, and that should maintain approximately 200 knots. So, power's coming in. We can be quite smooth with the power. There we go. Now, we need to consider the profile. Because we've leveled at Glesk, it's now considering 2,500 feet at ATF. That's perfect for the intercept. But I do want to uh, change the profile a little bit. So I'll change the VNAV profile from 3 degrees to 2.5. Enter there, and that says the next descent is in 34 seconds. So let's get right on that. I'll put a lower altitude in. So we'll descend down to 4,000 feet. Put it into VNAV. We've got VPATH, flight level 40. So push to QNH and VPATH, 4,000 feet. Again, as we turn and descend, we need to bring that power back out again. Notice as well, we said we'd be turning at 25 from the ADN, and that's what we have here. There's the descent, so power's coming off, back to around about 40% or so. Right, there's the So we can see that the selected target is 4,000. The VNAV is planning on going down to 2,500. That's because we moved, we removed the constraints that don't work properly on the laminar uh, implementation. So it's only targeting ATF. So keeping that airspeed in the scan. Looking at the cumulative distance to the runway, it's 30 miles. I'm at 8,000 feet. 8 times 3 is 8, 16, 24. That kind of fits nicely. We've got more than enough space to get down uh, on the profile. Wings level for a second, so I'll move the heading bug around. And while we've got uh, a minute or so to the next waypoint, let's have a look at that turn again. So as we cross the Delta 170 Tango, the aircraft would take us directly to the ATF. That lateral profile is fine. That would work completely perfectly. But we need to make sure that we've got the ILS tuned prior to the ATF, or displayed, sorry, prior to the ATF, left its own devices, the aircraft would only show it after the ATF. So I'm going to do that turn, not in GPS, but in heading. It's suggesting a course of 013, it was 340 was the inbound track, which is there. I'll fly a 35 degree intercept, which is 015, which is very similar to what the aircraft was predicting. Remember, the lateral track is OK. It's simply to facilitate changing the CDI over. We're going to do it in heading. So 
So there's the aircraft sequencing the next waypoint, now going to the D185 Tango. D185 Tango is above 3200, so I'll put 3200 feet in the altitude select window. We've got alt select 3200. We'll do the approach uh, decelerated, but in the final stages I'll come back to about 180 knots and then 160 for the intercept. So after the next waypoint we can put 2500 feet in and then as we approach the D170T we'll go into heading mode and turn towards the ILS intercept. Once we're in the heading mode we're going to change the CDI to present the ILS. We've already got the ident up here, IABD, so that's fine. And then we'll go into approach mode. It should be straightforward. On the next waypoint as well I'll just make a slight power reduction and we'll start slowing down from 200 knots back towards 180 knots. We've got a distance of 20 miles to go to the runway. We need uh, just under 18 miles, so that looks okay. So there's the next waypoint. We can go down to 2,500 feet. You can see it in here. Target above 2,500 feet. And I'll just back the torque off just a little bit start to come back to around about 180 knots. So it's recalculated a 2.8 degree. I don't quite know why it's done that, but everything seems to be working out okay. If it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do, we could go into vertical speed mode and adjust as required. But the next thing that's going to happen is as we turn at the waypoint, I'm simply going to go into heading mode and allow the aircraft to fly this way in heading. Just need to bring the power back just a little bit more. There we go. Turning in 10 seconds, it's saying 013. I'm actually going to go to 015. So, heading select. And the aircraft's in the turn. Now, because it's in heading, I can happily change the CDI. I now have the ILS presentation. You see it's gone green to indicate the ILS is tuned or, or indicating there as well. We've still got alt capture at 2500 feet. It's in heading mode at the moment with V path. The two way point for the GPS system is still the ATF. It's still ahead of us, which means the flight plan is still sequencing correctly. I'm going to put it into the approach mode and we see we got localizer and glide slope armed. I'm back at 180 knots, just outside uh, 11 miles. DME2 is from the VOR, which is beyond the airfield, so it's really the distance Vertical down here. Track. This is a GPS-derived distance, this is a DME-derived distance, but we don't need to worry about that technicality just now. So, 10 miles, I'll bring the torque off again, and we'll come back to approximately 160 knots. So again, the lateral track would have worked, the only reason we're in heading early is so I could change the displayed nav source because it wouldn't have given me the ILS until after ATF, by which point it would be a bit too late. If we wanted to still follow the GPS track, we've got it on the uh, arrows in here. I'm going to maintain 160 knots down to approximately 6 miles. You can see the localizer is coming in. I've got localizer and glide slope. So I'm going to set 3000 for the missed approach. The missed approach at Aberdeen is uh, ahead to 3000 feet. That's quite straightforward. There's 160 knots. And once it's wings level, I'm simply going to push the heading bug again to synchronize that all up. I'm all done with the flight plan uh, page now. 
So over the ATF, 2,500 feet, it's a sensible glide slope. We've got one height check-in on the glide slope. If we can get another check-in, that's ideal, but we don't need to really worry about that on a flight simulator. Six miles. We'll reduce the power a little bit. We'll put the gear down. So there's gear down, three greens, 10% torque is reasonable. I'm just delaying the flap selection to avoid the aircraft ballooning up by taking flaps at a higher speed. But we'll have the flaps uh, to the first position before we go below 120 knots. There's flaps to take off. And looking for about 100 knots at four miles to run. So there we go, 110 knots, maybe a touch on the fast side. I'll take the final stage of flap. And as we've got the final stage of flap, uh, flap selected, I'll just bring the power forward because uh, landing flap is very draggy on this aircraft. Looking for around about uh, 85 to 90 knots in the final stages of the instrument approach. So 1,000 feet above the field, 1,000 radio, 1,000 above the field elevation, speeds below 100 knots, and we're fully configured for landing. Again, it's a light aircraft with a powerful engine. We don't need to worry uh, overly about making airliner-style stabilised approach criteria, but in the early stages of flying it, it's always a good idea to uh, have a, a slightly earlier stabilised approach so you can get all the power settings correctly. If you struggle with this aircraft, I'd strongly recommend that you get the speed stable before you take the autopilot out. So we're about 500 feet above the ground. On speed. We can see the pappies ahead of us. So we've got gear down, three greens, flap full, separators on, bunny lights on, and fuel's balanced. Now, the alpha gauge is really very useful here. 85 was my initial guess. I'm just going to reduce the power ever so slightly so that I have some indication on the alpha gauge. If I've got some indication and a number of green bars showing, then the approach speed is fine. I'm going to take the autopilot out and I'll keep flying the aircraft. You see, it's just coming in to the uh, alpha gauge territory now. I can keep flying those flight directors. Got to be aware that we've got very sensitive uh, control over the power. Sometimes the flight directors are more of a hindrance than anything else. So using the pappies, the glide slope target, being aware of the airspeed. Again, it's a nice long runway, so 85 or below should be okay. But that alpha gauge Minimum. is looking reasonable. Minimum. We're on the center line, we're on the glide slope, we're in trim, just correcting for the wind. I don't want all the speed to bleed off at this point. And we'll be smooth with the power reduction and smooth with the round out. Keep flying it down initially. Power slowly to idle. Pitch to hold it off. A little bit of a float. And we're down. Nose gear's down. Push the reverser and taxi range should be enough to decel here. We've got reverse if we need it. We're going to take the first exit. So just some wheel braking there. Down to about 15 knots. And then we'll take the first left. This is helicopter runway 05 at Aberdeen. We'd obviously have to ask air traffic before we vacated here in real life. But that's not going to be a problem today. What's most important is I'm not going to go heads down and start flicking switches until we're clear of the active runway and we know where we're going. I'm going to taxi out towards this hangar here before finding a parking space but not touching anything at the moment. So 
So nicely vacated, I'll bring the flaps in, put the taxi light on, and we'll turn off the pito and the uh, stall pro peters to cancel the caution that generates. I can turn off the flight directors just to clear up the display a little bit. And if we have the chance to do so, on a straight uh, taxi section, make sure that the traffic system's gone off and we'll turn the radar to off. We can also zoom in on here if we need some awareness and we can get the charts. If in doubt, if we get lost, we're just going to stop and ask for directions from air traffic. So we should be able to park along here uh, just at the just at the end on the left. Okay, so there's the the turn here. I'll turn off the landing lights and the taxi lights just in case there's somebody ready to marshal us. And we'll just follow the, the lead off line here onto the stand. Get very fine control over the taxi speed with the propeller. You hardly need the brakes apart from to come to a stop. There we are, nicely stopped, parking brakes on, bing, flight idle. Just going to reset the trims very quickly. We need about two minutes cool down, which we've had, so the trims are neutral. I'll switch off the air conditioning, I'll switch off the bleed, and I'll move the power lever across to low idle. We'll be there for 15 seconds. You see the ITT rising as there's not so much airflow. 15 seconds at low idle will come to idle cutoff. Cancel the cautions we get. We've got low voltage, the oil pressure, and we'll listen for that auxiliary fuel pump kicking in. Remember, it's still set to auto. So as the engine driven pump cool, uh, slows down, we get the fuel pressure warning and the auxiliary boost, uh, auxiliary boost pump. So that's working. We can turn it all the way to off. Now we've stopped safely. Parking brake set and the propeller is uh, stopped as well. So let's switch off the fuel selector, the trims, the oxygen, nav and strobes off. We can go into the transponder. We'll put 2000 and standby. We'll switch the inertial separator off. Check we've done everything up there. Again, top to bottom. Everything's off. We'll turn those panel lights off now. Everything's back in the condition we had it before. Everything's selected off here. The parking brake's set. That's all set correctly. We'll select the fuel off. It'll bing at us as well. We'll ask the ground crew to put the chocks in. And we're just waiting for a second for the inertial separator to close fully. Once that's happened, quick check on the temperatures, it's reasonable, and then we'll turn the crash bar off. Last thing to do is the standby display is running on its own battery now. We don't want to drain that battery unnecessarily, so we'll simply shut it down. We can open the door, and with that, we're part on stand. Quite straightforward. We can use the payload screen to put the uh, various different covers in place. I'll put the engine cover on. It won't actually put it on because the temperatures are still pretty hot. But as soon as the aircraft's cooled down, those covers will be applied. We can have a look at how the engine's doing even when it's shut down. 
by bringing up the engine temperatures. This would be the equivalent of standing next to it and just feeling how warm the thing is. And at the moment it's still fairly hot on the outside. So once it's cooled down, the covers will be put in place. That's us at the end of the second video. Uh, between video one and video two, we've seen a full IFR flight from one uh, regional airport to another regional airport, a full IFR departure and procedural arrival on the instrument landing system. We've made ourselves aware of the importance of keeping those flight mode annunciators on the G1000 in the scan at all times. Whenever we're approaching a level off, we're going to stop what we're doing and concentrate on the thrust at all times. And most importantly, on the G1000, if we're going to use VNAV, we have to examine the vertical profile that is coded as the flight plan is loaded from the database, because at the moment, that's one of the weaknesses in the Laminar G1000 implementation. It's a lot better than the G1000 was when X-Plane 11 first came out. Uh, I didn't like using it back then. What we've got at the moment on the TBM is more than satisfactory for the vast majority of things we want to do with it. So it's not a problem at all. You've seen the level of systems fidelity on the TBM. In the next video, we're going to look at another IFR flight, this time IFR largely outside controlled airspace, and then perhaps a, a circling approach into Dundee Airport. The ILS at Dundee is normally a tailwind, so we'd have to circle to land at Dundee. I hope the video has made sense. If you've got any uh, comments or questions, please put them in the comments section. Always check the video description for errors and omissions. If there's anything that I've missed or forgot to do in the video, I'll make sure that's annotated in the video description. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you're able to tune in for the next video in the series. Thanks very much.